welcome everybody. Thanks for attending the presentation. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're um, listening from. I'm Percy right now in New Orleans. Um, so it's early in the morning, but fortunately I'm not in my regular place of Vancouver, which would be very early in the morning. Um, so this forward has some, uh, this presentation has some forward looking statements. Um, if you have any questions about what those are, are um, please refer to our CDAR filings, which are available on CDAR.com. So first I want to introduce myself. I'm Paul Brennan, I'm president and CEO of the company. I've been in the industry for over 30 years. I started um, at AstraZeneca, I spent much of my time in Europe, in um, Sweden or in the UK, uh, and then have since switched into biotech, mostly working in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in my career, I've worked on over 10 products that have gone from development stage through to approval and have worked on business development deals uh, totaling over $3 billion in value. Um, not on this presentation, but I think it's also important for me to introduce is Dr. Dan Michael. He's our chief medical officer that joined the company about a year ago. Dan's a trained neurologist and also has a PhD in neurosciences. Um, early in his career, he treated mostly MS patients and was involved in MS trials, um, and then moved into the industry to look at developing drugs. And most recently was executive director in charge of CNS therapeutics at Amgen. And that's really important because as you'll see, we're a drug development company and having a management team that's previously successfully developed drugs is really important. So I'm just gonna jump in really quickly as to the highlights of the company, where what we are. So we're a company developing drugs to repair damage to the nervous system. So anytime that there is damage to the nervous system, whether it's a result of something like a, an acute injury, like a spinal cord injury or a concussion or a chronic disease like uh, Alzheimer's or MS, we have a unique technology that allows the nervous system to repair itself. Now, what's really exciting is we are focusing on Alzheimer's, spinal cord injury, and multiple sclerosis, three really important indications. We're currently in phase one in healthy volunteers, and we're gonna be starting trials in patients by the end of this year with the possibility of results already in mid next year to late next year. Now, most people, when they look at companies developing products for Alzheimer's disease or, or MS, think about long, large, expensive trials. But what's unique about us is we're focusing, rather than on stopping the progression of the disease, we're focused on repairing damage. And that means we can study fewer patients and the studies can go quicker, which means less dollars. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the technology, how it works, and then I'm going to go into specifically what we're doing for each of the indications. Generally speaking, most people know what the nervous system is. It's your brain and your spinal cord. And they know that it's a complex system that controls thought, movement, and senses. What most people believe to be the case is that if you damage the nervous system, it can't repair itself. We, we know that people in, uh, in wheelchairs from spinal cord injury get very little recovery. Or in, if you have multiple sclerosis and you're in a walker, you're in that walker for, for, for good. You don't recover from that. Or the Alzheimer's patients don't re reverse themselves. But the reality is the nervous system does have the ability to repair itself. So I'm gonna show, I know it said in the instructions not to show video, but this should work. This is an example of an experiment where a rat has been given a severe injury to the hind legs. So on the left, what you see is what happens when the animal is treated with placebo. So the animal is being asked to walk along a beam, turn around and get uh, run back. And you can see the legs are severely paralyzed. The tail is down and the animal is mostly moving with its foreleg. On the right, we have an animal that's been treated with our drug once a day for seven weeks. And you can see here a dramatic difference. The animal's walking, uh, no problem. The legs are underneath the hips, the tail is up, and look at it scurry back. You can repair the nervous system. 
that's something that most people didn't think was possible, but it turns out it is. The person who believed it was possible was Dr. Jerry Silver. Dr. Jerry Silver is a professor and researcher at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. For him, this is something that's an overnight success that took 30 years in the making. He believed that there were negative factors in the brain that were stopping the brain from repairing itself. Um, we were able to detect and uh, to identify Dr. Silver's um, experiments based on a keen interest from one of our founders who was looking for a solution to nervous system injury. He found Dr. Silver's work, saw the experiments, saw that what he was doing was quite different um, than anybody else, that he was getting results that nobody else was getting and licensed it from the company. We have full rights to the technology from Case Western Reserve. And what's really interesting is when we started digging into the technology, we realized that Dr. Silver's work, who was focusing on spinal cord injury, isn't just for spinal cord injury. It's for any time there's nervous system damage, has broad applications. So Dr. Silver's work, as I mentioned earlier, is based on years and years of uh, understanding and evolution. So already early in the, um, you know, a decade, uh, sorry, a century ago, the world knew that when you have damage to the nervous system, you have a scar that forms. And it's that scar that permanently damages, damages the nervous system. What Dr. Silver identified was that in the scar is a class of molecules called CSPGs or chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. And it's the CSPGs in the scar that are actually causing the nervous system to, uh, to, to inhibit, the, it inhibits the nervous system from repairing itself. Um, in 2009, Dr. Silver identified how this was happening, a receptor that was present in the nervous system that was mediating this response. And then 2015, uh, uh, he uh, identified a drug that works and acts on a receptor that stops the inhibition of the nervous system and allows a repair. That drug is our lead product, MVG291. So you can see on the left here, is an image of a neuron that's growing in a Petri dish. And you know, what happens in the presence of CSPGs, it, that, it gets stuck. They literally become stuck in CSPGs and they can't release this nerve. Uh, in this system, the neuron wants to stretch out and form new connections and it can't. If you administer the drug, you see, and on the right here, all of a sudden now, in the presence of CSPGs, it doesn't matter. It can form new connections. Our product um, is a peptide. It'll be administered once a day subcutaneously. And we, what we do is we give it to patients for anywhere from three months to six months, and we'd expect to see those reparative effects. So a little bit about more how it works. The nervous system actually, in the beginning, we said everybody knows that the nervous system doesn't have the ability to repair itself. It turns out there are a number of endogenous systems uh, available to repair nervous system damage. Increased plasticity, which is the ability to use the existing system to form new connections. Axon regeneration, remyelination, and other repair mechanisms. So when you have damage, you have a scar that forms. And in that scar, you have this upregulations of the CSPGs. And what that does is it inhibits these repair mechanisms. You see less plasticity, axon regeneration, remyelination. What our drug does is it interrupts this inhibition that's being caused by the CSPGs. And as a result, you have an increase of these repair mechanisms, plasticity, axon regeneration, and remyelination. Now, you don't feel re uh, plasticity. You don't feel axon regeneration. It has to translate into something that's a functional benefit. That's things like m walking again, like you saw in the video, or uh, it's increased sensory skills, being able to feel pain or heat and cold, um, improved autonomic function like bladder control, which is really important for spinal cord injury patients, or uh, even 
improved ability to have memory. And what we've seen is that the repair effects that we're seeing actually translate to these improved functional effects. We've seen both uh, fine motor control and gross motor control improved, improved sensory function, improved bladder function, and even improved memory. Um, so now what, we, what we're seeing here is in um, a, what we see in the slide, five different models that we have neurological improvements crossing all the major neurological functions. This is really quite a broad effect and across multiple models. This is unprecedented. You don't see this in animal experiments with, uh, with therapies that are attract, uh, um, <clears throat> focusing on nervous system damage. With all this different um, pharmacological effects, what does it mean for how this technology can be used? Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it can be used when there's any damage to the nervous system, we believe, whether that damage is a result of a trauma, such as a spinal cord injury or a concussion, or a, as a result of a disease, such as multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's. We're focusing on spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, MVG291 currently is in phase one clinical trials. So this is really exciting. We're in the clinic. Um, what we're trying to do out of our phase one clinical trials is, is determine which dose we can go to in patients, determine the safety profile, and determine the pharmacokinetics. Phase one has two components to it, single doses and multiple doses. We're completed the single dose portion. We're now um, two thirds of the way through the multiple dose portion uh, part where we're treating subjects, healthy subjects, for 14 days. In the single dose uh, ascending portion, um, that was a huge success for us. Um, we were able to look at the safety profile after a single dose, uh, no serious or uh, un unexpected adverse events. The most common events was injection site reaction, which was expected. Um, and we were able to get to doses that were almost two times as high as the highest equivalent dose used in animal experiments that was efficacious, and over a hundred times higher than the lowest effective dose. So we're well above the effective dose range, which is really important. The pharmacokinetic characteristics were really good. We saw that the drug was rapidly absorbed after a subcutaneous injection, and um, we saw that um, um, the half-life was really long, longer in humans compared to rodents. What we're finding from the multiple descending dose so far is that the safety profile is pretty similar. We're not seeing any serious uh, or severe adverse events. Um, injection site reactions are the most common and the pharmacokinetic uh, parameters are similar to what we saw in um, a single ascending dose, which is really positive. It means uh, uh, there's no accumulation. Um, we still have a little bit more work to do in phase one before we go into patients. Um, that includes um, uh, finishing this cohort and then moving towards uh, uh, expanding the population that we're studying, including uh, uh, males in the study and premenopausal females. So quickly on to our indications, Alzheimer's disease. Currently, most people know uh, something about Alzheimer's disease. Usually someone's connected to someone in their life that's had Alzheimer's disease. It's quite pervasive. There are 6 million uh, adults in the United States currently that have Alzheimer's disease. And the therapies there are really a poor choice. They're symptomatic um, and there's been one disease modifying therapy most recently approved, which has, if anything, a marginal benefit at best. I mentioned that uh, um, we actually have in our studies shown that we have improvements in memory. So this is uh, the demonstration of that in, in working. This is a, a model done mice where they've been um, asked to learn how to find ho holes to escape uh, bright lights and a fan. Um, um, they've been given a stroke and then treated with our product or placebo. And you're looking for that ability for our product to restore the, the learning and memory ability. So here's another video. The time taken and the number of mistakes made to find the location of the target zone are measures of the animal spatial learning and memory abilities. The first animal in the video is a healthy animal and has not had a stroke. 
the healthy animal located the target zone in just over nine seconds. The second animal is a control animal. It has had a stroke and then was treated with placebo. Notice how long it takes a control animal to identify the target zone. This control animal located the target zone in just over a minute and 30 seconds. The third animal has had a stroke and was then treated with NerveGen's NVG291. Notice how it remembers and locates the target zone in a significantly shorter amount of time than the control animal. The NVG291 treated animal located the target zone in just over 20 seconds. So in Alzheimer's disease, um, we've got lots of data to suggest that we'll work here. The most important thing is that we know that these CSPGs that I talked about that are in the scars in the brain are present in Alzheimer's uh, patients. So we see as we go from no cognitive impairment to mild cognitive impairment and up to Alzheimer's disease in patients, there's a concentration of CSPGs. We know through preclinical study that if you break down these CSPGs, you get an improvement uh, in Alzheimer's symptoms. Or if you move the receptor that we've detected, which we believe mediates the response, you get an improvement in Alzheimer's symptoms. And we know that our mechanisms of axon regeneration, increased plasticity, um, and remyelination will benefit Alzheimer's patients. Our plan is to initiate a study in all Alzheimer's patients by the end of this year. Um, we plan to study approximately 80 patients, um, and that study should read out in early 2024. This will be a multi-center placebo-controlled study. And what we'll do is be studying both cognitive abilities as well as biomarkers that will give us an indication of their efficacy, such as um, um, uh, blood biomarkers, as well as uh, imaging. What's really interesting about this study uh, is it's designed to give us the best chance of showing an effect of MVG291. We designed it with our advisory board. And if you take a look at the names of this advisory board, if you know anything about Alzheimer's, you'll recognize these names. And I, I encourage people to Google Jeff Cummings or George Perry, Risa Spelling, or Michael Werner. These are experts in the field um, uh, who um, will work on, um, who Pharma would be very happy to have on any of their advisory boards. In fact, this is a better advisory board than you'd see most Pharma put together because there's uh, competitive views in terms of what's the best therapies going forward. Spinal cord injury um, is another area where we're working in. Currently, there are no drugs approved in spinal cord injury. Here's another video of animals um, treated with our product to show the magnitude of response we're seeing. These animals are trained to go up a ladder. On the left, you see this animal has no ability to use its hind legs. On the right, you'll see uh, after treatment with our product for seven uh, weeks that the animal can climb. There's coordination, it's bearing weight. Um, again, this level of response is unprecedented. And here you can see the magnitude of the response uh, as it's across multiple animals. What we've done um, is use what's called the BBB score to measure that magnitude of response. An animal with 21 is a perfectly functional animal. An animal with zero has no function whatsoever. And so what we do is tr um, treat the animal with placebo and you'll see there's some spontaneous recovery, but the animals really only get to a five or six, as you can see in the, uh, in the video, not much ability to use the hind legs. In our treated animals in this experiment, the ones that responded, which is about half the animals, got to measurements uh, of around 18, 19, or 20. That's almost a full recovery. Those are the results that are unprecedented that you don't see in preclinical experiments. Those are the results that have the spinal cord injury community really excited about the potential of this uh, technology. Um, just for a matter of time, I'll skip over the slide and talk about our clinical trial, which we're really excited about. That trial also plans to begin um, at the end of this year. We'll be treating uh, two different populations of spinal cord injury patients, uh, patients that have had injuries from one year to uh, 10 years, uh, which we call the chronic patients, and patients that are newly injured from around three weeks to about three months. Um, this is a single center study. We'll be doing it at SRA Labs in Chicago. And it's a really interesting study because it uses novel techniques for detecting e efficacy. We'll be looking both at things like 
uh, movement, the ability to use their limbs, uh, either their, their arms or their legs, but also really sensitive measures of uh, uh, electrical conductance, looking at the nerves and the ability of the, of the uh, patient to be able to generate movement themselves or the ability uh, of the, the nerves to, and the ability of the nerve to conduct signals. Again, we have a world leading uh, uh, advisory board um, a, advising us on the outcome uh, or the design of this trial. Um, really happy to have James Guest, Brian Kwan, Daniel Lamertizzi, Linda Jones, and James Kirschbaum advising us. These are names in the spinal cord injury field that everybody would recognize. And then finally, multiple sclerosis. Um, now, what's interesting about multiple sclerosis is there are some good therapies, but the current therapies for multiple sclerosis don't help address the accumulation of disability that occurs over time. What the current therapies do is they address the day-to-day -day symptoms that occur for multiple sclerosis patients, the tingling, the blurred vision. But what happens is that the damage that occurs in these patients is, is, uh, is the, the progressive disability that occurs is permanent. And none of the current therapies at the moment help with that disability. So patients end up with a walker, um, a wheelchair, eventually bedridden, and there's nothing that can be done. Um, another video, I, um, we're full of videos. Uh, this is an example of mice that are given uh, MS-like symptoms. So in the hind legs, you can see they can't use their hind legs and the, um, they can use their forelimbs. You see after 10 days of injection with our therapy on the right, the animal's starting to get some movement. After 15 days, the animal tree with our ther therapy can walk. It's not perfect, the legs are splayed, the tail is down. On the left, the animal's treated with placebo, there's no improvement. After 20 days, now you see the tail's up, the hind legs underneath the hips, uh, uh, sorry, the legs are underneath the hips, um, and the animal's walking. And after 21, five days, this persists and the animal treated placebo never gets an improvement. So here, what we're doing is addressing what the current therapies don't do, which is we're repairing the damage to the nervous system. Um, this quickly, this is a picture of a spinal cord. You can see that um, uh, there's a lesion that's occurred. It's the white area. Um, the, the dark area is the myelin. So what we do is inject a detergent which damages the spinal cord. Uh, and you can see after three days, there's a big lesion. After 21 days, there's some repair in the placebo group, but in the NVG291 treated group, that damage is completely repaired. That is what's called remyelination. Myelin is the fatty tissue that covers the axon, which is the main condition of multiple sclerosis, is the dis uh, disappearance of the myelin. Our multiple sclerosis study is also exciting. Uh, it'll start in the um, early 2023 uh, and read out in 2024. Um, um, we'll be uh, recruiting roughly about 80 patients, um, placebo controlled, um, and looking for uh, things like mobility, um, as well as, uh, again, imaging biomarkers, looking at the ability for the myelin to remyelinate itself, not myelin itself. Again, advising us is an advisory board of industry experts that would be present on any pharma advisory board. Now quickly, just going into uh, uh, fi finance related to the company, we're currently listed on the Venture Exchange in Toronto and the OTCQX uh, um, in, um, in the US as well as in Europe. Um, our recent share price uh, is about 220. Uh, we have 27 million shares outstanding. Our share structure is pretty simple. Um, it's common shares plus options and warrants uh, with no complications related to either of the options or the warrants. Fully diluted 63 million shares. Insider ownership to the company is 10%. And the current cash uh, position is a little uh, over US $10 million. Um, this is a trans transformative year for NerveGen. There's quite a lot going on. We're currently in the middle of our phase one trial. That should be finishing uh, in the next uh, couple of quarters. And we'll be initiating our trials in patients being a phase two uh, company by the end of this year with really early readouts, with the possibility of a readout already mid to late uh, next year for the first indication and other indications reading out late 23 or early 24. On, a, on top of that, we have other really important milestones. 
Um, we've got preclinical data. You've seen some of the preclinical data that we've been able to generate where we show things that haven't been shown before. We have more preclinical studies that are ongoing. And what we still plan to do is challenge what people think are possible in terms of nerve repair. And so we'll be uh, publishing those in the next, in the coming months. Um, we're seeking grants and non-dilutive funding through the US DOD and other private sources. And we think those will be important value drivers for the company. And then finally, we recognize, um, particularly for US investors, that not being on a NASDAQ is uh, a, 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 an inhibition to buying the stock. So we're planning to get onto NASDAQ as soon as possible. So uh, as I close the presentation, hopefully these are the take home messages you take taken from this. First of all, this therapy really is, has the ability to redefine treatment paradigms. Currently in nervous system damage, there's nothing nothing available to treat the damage. In the, in the neuroscience space, what people are trying to do is limit the damage that's occurring, trying to stop progression of the disease. And some are having success at that in, in some indications, but not in others. This is quite different. We're trying to repair the damage once it's occurred. This would be the first neuroreparative therapy on the market, and it would redefine the market. The evidence we have is really quite over, overwhelming. We've got evidence from six different disease models, five of them in the neuroscience space, one outside the neuroscience space, showing that the repair that we have crosses all the major neurological functions. The diseases that we're studying all have significant unmet needs. There's no therapy for spinal cord injury, no effective therapies, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And in multiple sclerosis, the therapies only address the day-to-day -day symptoms. They don't help um, um, treat the disability that occurs. The markets that we have are significant. Spinal cord injury by itself is blockbuster. MS is a large market with multiple blockbuster products. And Alzheimer's is blue sky. And that doesn't count other potential indications that we can piggyback off, including uh, concussion or stroke. Um, and then finally, the management team. Um, you met myself um, and Dan. We're experienced drug developers. We've successfully developed products from development stage through to approval. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, a management team with experience in biotech, Bill Adams, our CFO, and Nana Collette, uh, our v of pro uh, VP of program management. We have an ad board uh, advising us, which is really impressive. These are the world leaders in their space. And then we have a board with experienced pharma and biotech development experience. And with that, that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Yeah, thank you, great presentation. Um, there's already the first question in the chat. So um, if NVG uh, 291 works, how much would it cost to fix a chronic spinal cord injury? So that is actually, that's a good question. That, that's actually, um, it's too early in our development cycle to know what the price will be for a new product. Um, it really depends on how broadly a population it works on, um, uh, whether we're treating chronic injuries, chronic and acute injuries. Um, and also it depends on whether or not our product is gonna be used for other indications as well. Um, we believe that if it works in spinal cord injury, it'll also work in stroke and uh, it will work in MS and Alzheimer's disease. So determining the price is not just for spinal cord injury or not just for MS. Um, and so at this point, what that price might be, it's, it's, it's far too early to say. Um, you can look at precedents for pricing uh, in Alzheimer's disease or in multiple sclerosis and assume that the annual cost of our product would be similar to what it would be for a new product in the MS or Alzheimer's space. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe in that regard answer how many doses it would take or how long it would, the treatment would take? Yeah, that's a good question. So in our first efficacy trials, we're treating patients for three months. So once a day for three months. And we hope that would, uh, we, we expect that that's gonna give us a substantial response. Um, maximum, I would imagine, is six months um, for something like an injury. For someone who has a chronic disease, we're not curing the disease, we're repairing the damage. 
So you can imagine for an MS patient or an Alzheimer's patient, we might treat them for a period of three months to six months, then they get a vacation from the drug. Uh, and as their disease progresses again, you treat them again to repair the damage that's occurred. So it would be periodic treatment, three months on, maybe three months off, uh, something like that. We still have to do the trials to confirm what that would be. Yeah. Um, the next question from the chat is, um, why haven't you been bought out by a larger corporation yet? Well, we, you know, we have a very good um, share structure uh, um, and we know most of our shareholders. We're not interested in being buy not bought out at this point. Um, and the reason is because there's considerably, especially in the next six to 18 months, considerable value to be created. Uh, the moment that we show that this really exciting um, mechanism translates from animals to humans, we've created an incredible amount of value. So our shareholders are saying, we don't want you to sell yourselves now. We want you to show this works in humans. And then if someone is interested in buying you, you consider it, but don't get bought out now. Um, yeah, another interesting question is, um, will you be allowed to use it for compassionate use? Um, wow, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there, so we, we don't have a compassionate use policy formed just yet. Um, we expect that there will be an ability to use it for compassionate use, but until we know the type of effect that we're seeing, we don't know how that compassionate use program will be, uh, um, you know, how it will be set up. We don't know which compassionate patients, which patients would qualify for it, but we know that both in uh, the United States and in Europe, there are good compassionate use programs, and it's something that we'll uh, spend a lot of time discussing amongst ourselves what the compassionate use program will be, will be but um, we don't, we haven't made any final decisions as to what that will be. But yes, there's that ability and it's something that we're going to discuss as a company as we move forwards. Uh, another question from the chat. Um, after a stroke, there's uh, often natural healing process anyway. Can the, can your product uh, accelerate the healing process? And I would say it, 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 yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, the answer to that, we believe yes, and not just uh, accelerate it, but more accurately complement the accelerating process. So the that's, that's, that's a really good point because the what happens um, in the accelerating process in stroke, that's an example of plasticity. That's an example of the existing neurons taking on additional effect. But you'll know that many stroke patients don't get full healing at all. Um, they still left with slurred speech or uh, um, uh, their, their problems walking. And that's because they haven't, that's actually because of these CSPGs I talk about are present in a stroke, they're present in the brain and they're inhibiting that repair. There's, you're allowed to, uh, the nervous system can have some repair, but you can see that it doesn't have fully repair. Um, and so what we would see and what we expect to see is improvement, more repair than you would see without any treatment at, uh, at all. And, and, and that improvement, um, this is really important in stroke, you don't need to pay, uh, currently with stroke therapies, you need to treat the patients within 24 hours to see that improvement. Not for us, we've got data showing that that improvement can occur even if you start treatment seven days after the stroke, and we believe uh, much longer after the stroke. Yeah, and uh, how will you uh, finance the, the future trials? Will you, will you partner up with big pharma companies or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're looking at all different options to finance. Um, we're looking at non-dilutive grants. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we're talking with the DOD and private sources. Um, we're looking at, we, can, we will consider partnering, um, but that's a very dilutive way of, of uh, developing uh, your product, but that's an option. And then third is through uh, access to uh, new capital through the public markets. Um, uh, it's an option as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh... As I, as I saw in, the, in the, the presentation, it really looks like a game changer. So here's a question. Uh, it seems like it could be considered a breakthrough therapy. So do you envision that the FDA will grant you that status? Absolutely. Yeah, we, ex exactly. That's, that would be our, uh, if, if the, the results that we see, that you saw in the videos translate to the humans, this is a breakthrough therapy. Um, and um, we will apply for breakthrough status 
uh, probably first uh, spinal cord injury, uh, but also uh, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, all of these has the potential for fast track and breakthrough status, which is really exciting because we could get to the market much quicker than most people think um, uh, if we see these effects because there's no therapy, no therapy approved whatsoever for spinal cord injury. And for your ongoing uh, phase one trials, do you also need additional capital or are you, are you finally- No, we're good, we're good. All right, so, okay. And I also imagine that um, finding patients for your uh, phase two trial should be quite easy because people will probably line up to get healed from their, their symptoms. Yeah, we are, I don't think recruitment's gonna be very difficult um, you know, we, I'm actually here in, in, um, in New Orleans at a spinal cord injury conference. Um, and we're, I would, you know, without a doubt, we're one of the best known therapies being developed in the spinal cord injury space. Um, and you know, we constantly get patients who are interested in participating in clinical trials. Um, this for them is the most interesting thing in clinical development at the moment. And so we're bombarded with with uh, um, uh, patients that are interested in participating, which is, is great for us. Um, and we expect the same thing will happen once we move into the MS space and into the Alzheimer's space, because we're doing things um, that, that, that other therapies aren't doing. We're really quite unique in terms of what we're trying to do in our approach. And that's exciting for patients. They wanna participate in trials where they have that opportunity to improve. And that's what we're, those trials offer for them. And uh, is, is there any potential danger that this technology could be copied in any way? We have a patent, um, a great patent uh, um, on our IP, um, uh, um, a composition of matter patent, which is the most important patent that you have. So no company can come with this uh, molecule uh, until at least the late uh, 2030s. All right. So you already addressed three huge markets, but I would imagine that uh, healing the nervous system would address like several other potential uh, markets with your product, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I focus mostly on stroke. Sorry, on uh, on Alzheimer's disease, yeah. multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury. But add to that stroke. Um, add to that concussion. Uh, and then there are um, other diseases uh, that aren't as common as like there's almost a million stroke patients a year, but you also have things like ALS, uh, um, uh, Parkinson's, all of those are potential uh, uh, additional indications. Okay, so uh, the time is nearly up. So one last question, and maybe you can even wrap it up with a conclusion. So yep. um, if the last question is, um, could there be any, any, any side effects? from uh, your treatment? Yeah, that's a good question. So in our, in our phase one trials, the side effects that we've seen uh, so far are injection site reactions, which is expected when you inject a peptide uh, beneath the skin. And that's all we've seen really up to this point. Other than that, I mean, always with any therapy, there's the potential for side effects. And until you do the large scale studies, you don't know what they are. But we haven't really seen anything of, uh, in our toxicity studies that give us concern um, going forwards. So we're not, um, we're not really expecting any major complications um, uh, with this therapeutic. And so with that, I, I'll wrap up and say thanks, everybody, for um, listening to the presentation. Uh, appreciate your time. If you'd like to learn more about our company, nervegen.com, our website has a lot of information. Uh, please go there. Um, and you can email me. My contact details are here or any of my colleagues who are listed, also listed. Thank you very much.